Good morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Excellent. Let's all stand up together. We're going to do a song that we introduced last week. If you remember this, just if you don't follow Clint, he's got it down pat. He'll sing it. You can follow him. We'll sing a line, you sing a line, then we all sing together. It's fun. Right, Clint? Nah. Here we go. To you, oh Lord, I lift my soul. And you, oh Lord, and you, oh Lord, alone I trust. Alone I trust. Teach me your path. Teach me your path. Show me your ways. Guide me in your truth. singing the psalms this morning as we are instructed by scripture to do singing new songs and psalms that was psalm 25 i want to have you take a seat for just a minute we're going to talk about this next song that we're going to sing uh, to give you a good background on it the song was written by uh, a man from the uk his name is matt redmond he's written so many great songs and courses uh, over the last few years he was the worship minister at his church in england and one day his pastor came to him and said, I just don't feel like we're worshiping like we need to be. We've lost something. We, we've lost sight of the reason we worship. It, our worship is just not there. So you can imagine, I know if, if Brother Dave came to me and said, yeah, you're not cutting it, <laughs> it would be a little disconcerting. So Matt Redmond said, what, what are we going to do? The pastor said, I want all the instruments gone. I want all the musicians gone. Everything off the stage. Everything, no lights, nothing, no music. And we're going to meditate during the time of worship until we figure out what we've missed in our worship. So the next Sunday, the bare stage, time for worship like now, nothing happened quiet, awkward silence, as you can imagine. And it went that way for 25 minutes before the, the preacher, the pastor took over. The next Sunday, the same thing. The Sunday after that, somebody finally stood up and shared a verse of scripture that was meaningful to them. And then someone shared something that uh, had happened in their lives. And then the next Sunday, someone shared a testimony of what God was doing. And then someone 
shared a verse of a song. And eventually, they filled that time with some authentic worship together. And then they finally brought the musicians back. Matt Redmond said, during that time, I wrote this song, and it was a prayer that they would once again find that heart of worship that they've lost. So we're going to sing this song that came out of that experience. We're going to just start with that chorus. I just want us to sing this. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, when it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. Let's stand together and worship. Just to gain something that's a word that will bless you.
Father, thank you for being at the heart of our worship this morning. Thank you for showing us who you are and what you are worth in our lives. Father, may we never allow anything to get in the way of our worship. May our worship be true, authentic, and pointed directly to you. In your name, amen. Good morning, church. So uh, Dave in, here in a few minutes is going to get out and give a message centered around our attitudes and specifically how uh, Christ can kind of transform our attitudes. And, you know, that's something that I get a privilege of getting to see kind of firsthand a lot more than maybe other positions and other people in the church. And that's because I'm a youth minister and I get to see kids just come in all the time and just it's, I'm always amazed, but not amazed at the same time and just how much. Uh, their hearts can change, and sometimes it looks like on the outward, nothing is happening. They're just blank stares, you know, but then I find out, you know, a week later that there is something going on, and it's just going on on the inside, and so I wanted to thank you guys, because I get to go on the, all these awesome trips and uh, with these kids and get to serve uh, these communities, various communities and stuff, and I can't do that without your guys' support, and I've been here for over five years, and I've got to say I've not once ever struggled financially, uh, and that is just such a blessing in a small church that's usually one of the big struggles, and uh, I want to thank you guys for your generosity, because anytime we go out to these trips, we're riding on the coattails of your support, and we couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for making that so easy and such a blessing. Um, this past week, we went to CIY. Uh, oh, actually, before I go to that, our next trip, upcoming trip that we have is uh, July 29th, and the high school group is about a group of eight. We're going down to Port Charlotte, Florida, and we're going to be helping with uh, disaster relief for Hurricane Ian. And so please pray for us as we make that trip out there. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm eager to see how Christ will move in these kids' lives. So 
keep that in your prayers, please. But uh, this past week, we went on the junior high CIY trip, and it was, again, just it's always the same thing. These kids come in, and they, they're kind of distant. You can tell their, their hearts are a little hard. And uh, just over the week, the desire that they have to know and learn from God and consider spiritual things is just, it just soars. And it's just always awesome to see that uh, God's still working. It definitely restores hope in me that, you know, like, yes, this is still happening to kids, you know, and it's great, uh, the transformation of their attitudes. But I had something happen to me that I've never really ha- had happen before. I was stuck in this situation in one of the sessions where I had two kids. I had one kid that got called up on stage, and there was another kid behind me. And I was stuck in this, like, kind of dual, uh, <laughs> dual nature because the kid that got called up, he got called up for great reason because he asked his youth minister, where, what, what should I do if I want to start with, when I'm studying Christianity? Where should I start? And the youth minister told him, uh, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Well, the kid miraculously took the youth minister's advice. Crazy. I'm telling you, that doesn't happen very often. And he stayed up till four in the morning and read all five books of the Bible. And so they called him up on stage to kind of just hear his heart of why he did that. And he let it slip during the session that he also took notes. And they're like, would you mind reading the notes that you took over Acts? And I'm telling you, I was blown away just because the kid was like, he took really good notes. You could tell this kid was not reading just for the achievement, right? He was reading to understand. And I thought that was awesome. But not five minutes later, (laughs) there was a kid sitting directly behind me. His youth minister was right next to him. And for about three to five minutes, he was saying pretty loudly on repeat things like this. I hate God. I'm never getting baptized. God is stupid. I want to go home. And I was wrestling internally because I was like, it's not my kid. It's not my kid. I can't say anything. But he was, he was speaking during the sermon, so it was really distracting. And I could just hear the youth minister back there going over and over, let's go outside. Come on, we need to go. <laughs> like, you can't be doing this. And he finally says, all right, let's go. And he gets more stern and he leaves. And the kid doesn't follow. And the guy doesn't come back. <laughs> I mean, there's another leader that's like four seats down, and this kid's kind of like in an island by himself. But he never comes back. I don't know if he was like out there praying or if he just reached his limit. But uh, it was just kind of interesting, this dual nature of just the transformation that can happen if someone is willing and just these two kids having two very different reactions. And what was ironic is the story was, the, 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 the sermon was about, was about Saul the Paul, right, the conversion. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we focus on Paul's conversion, and it is a miracle to think that Saul can go from breathing out murderous threats to breathing out loving blessings, right, and to completely change from being someone who's enslaving Christians and killing them to being one of the biggest advocates. But I think sometimes we fail to focus on just how much of a miracle it was for the church there to accept Paul, right? I mean, all these people that have known Paul, I mean, it's hard enough to deal with a kid who's breathing out insults over God. Can you imagine someone breathing out murderous threats and, and, and imprisoning our fellow believers? It's just hard to believe, but that's what uh, happened with Paul, and I just think it's, it's a miraculous story of Paul's conversion, but I want to challenge, challenge all of us. You know, I think sometimes we can kind of underestimate just how much God can truly transform people, especially if they're willing and if they place themselves at the feet of, of the cross, and so um, as we close out, I just want to challenge you guys to, uh, you know, I don't know what it is that you're wrestling with, what attitude it is that, that is going on in your heart, whether it's bitterness or apathy, but I want to challenge you to recenter your life on Christ. That's always a good place to start. And uh, I, you'll be blown away by the amount of change that can happen when you truly recenter your life on Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I pray for that kid. I don't know. Uh, I did see him later on, and I saw that he was smiling, and he didn't go home. And I just pray that you keep continue to work on his heart. I wouldn't be surprised, Lord, if he ends up in a year or two being a rock star player for your church. Uh, because that's how you work, God. That's how you move. Uh, I don't know what all the attitudes that are going on in our hearts today, uh, but Lord God, I pray that you soften them, that we can recenter our lives on you, and Lord, that you can give us your heart, your eyes, and your hands. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Austin. I love that. I love that. And you know, last week before the kids took off and uh, the youth and adults took off and everything, I encouraged everyone and asked them to be praying for them while they're gone throughout the week, you know, to to just kind of stretch them and help them kind of come out of their comfort zone so God could hear them and their hearts and everything. And, and now I'm going to ask you just to continue to pray for uh, those youth and adults that went that experienced that and the way that God maybe worked on their heart that maybe we don't know about now and may still be working on their heart, that, that they realize that God, or that we pray that God continue to work on their heart and, and uh, you know, help them understand who he is. And the same God, as you've heard me say many, many times, the same God that, that they met when they were there and they experienced and spoke to them and, 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 and everything is the same God that's at home with them right now. 
that's in their presence right now, that's here today and tomorrow and, 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 and will be in their life. So please continue to lift them up in prayers for that. But uh, I'm glad you're here with us this morning. Those watching online, thanks for tuning in and being here as we're continuing in this series as we're going through the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books because I just, I, I, I love it there. I mean, in, in just these few short verses that you see, you know, over 16 different times, the word joy or rejoicing is mentioned. And, and as we've learned, you know, that, that's not what we would expect to hear coming from someone writing this book because Paul wrote it when he was in jail. So joy and rejoicing isn't the thing that we would expect to have, but yet it's what we see as a great theme that's coming through here. And, and I love as he writes this, you know, uh, you know, he doesn't use a lot of big words, which I need. It's not like confusing theological concepts, and uh, which is great. It's practical. It's helpful uh, material that's there. And, and, and I love it as what we're learning as we're going through this. And, and if you missed out on any of the weeks, I want to encourage you to go back online and watch, you know, and see what we've learned up to this point. And the first week we learned that, you know, he who began a good work in us, He's faithful to complete it. We might not understand. We might feel that we're a wreck or not working right. But as we continue to turn towards him, we learn that God's not done with us yet. And he won't be done with us until we actually meet him until that time that he comes back or we meet him before, you know, he comes back. And, and la or the week after that, in our second week, of course, our nation was celebrating Independence Day. And, you know, we learned that, you know, it, yeah, it's good to celebrate that, but what our forefathers, and even more importantly, as we look through scripture, oh, we weren't called, we weren't created, we're not supposed to be independent, we're actually supposed to be interdependent. How wonderfully and beautifully we are made to need each other in our lives and to lean on each other in our lives. And so it was encouraging that, you know, th that we learned that. And then, of course, last week we learned that, you know, oh, we have a testimony that, uh, and a powerful testimony that as we turn to God, no matter what we're going through, and we allow God to come and work in our lives and use us in ways we can never imagine, it can actually be a wonderful testimony as other people see that in our lives. And today what we're going to take a look at, we're going to learn that, like Austin was talking about our attitude, that there's some things about our attitude we need to maybe rethink about. And, and you know, a, a lot of our attitude and everything that's going on with our attitude, you know, a lot of the times it gets because of what's happening on the outside of our lives, you know, and, and that, that changes and that focuses and our attitude and our actions change because so quickly because what's happening on the outside. For, for example, you know, you've got this favorite place you like to go eat, favorite restaurant, whatever you love to go eat. Every time you've been there, the service has been great. You know, the food's been great and all this other kind of stuff. And you got some family, friends, whatever that come in and stop by to see you. And you want to take them there because you want to bless them. You want them to have a good experience too. And I don't know, there's eight, nine, 10 of you, whatever you go out to this restaurant and the service just isn't the best all of a sudden that night. It just really isn't. And the food is really not good at all. And you, you know, and you do something you hardly rarely have ever done. You have to send it back because it just, it's not that good. And you know, they work on it and they bring it back out and it's still not that good. And you're really frustrated. You're really disappointed. You're really down. And you know, you, after a while, you kind of say to your friends, you know what? I'm so sorry. And you're apologizing. Can you, I'm so sorry. You're, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to come back. You know, and, and because of what you're experiencing. But then all of a sudden the manager comes over and the manager's saying, hey, I, I hear you're having this subpar experience here. And I'm so sorry things, you know, aren't the best and, and, and up to what our normal standards are. Please forgive me. that. I don't want to let you know, all 10 of you, it's on the house tonight and everybody gets a free round of drinks, you know, and hopefully you'll give us another chance. And you're like, sure we will, buddy. You know, and all of a sudden everything, you know, in the universe is just great and stacking up well because of these outside circumstances. And when Paul wrote Philippians, you know, and, and was going through this and, and, and stuff, you know, he says, look at our, our attitudes, our attitudes are so important because our attitudes are the foundation upon which our actions are built. And if we truly think about the attitude we should have because of a risen Christ, because of a Lord that loves us, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside, our attitude should be consistent and stay the same. And we're, we're going to learn uh, some ingredients here that when combined, I think will have us, will allow us to have that proper attitude in our heart that no matter what happens on the outside, you know, we can be like Paul in prison, rejoicing and have joy. The first thing he says is this, we need to make sure we're living a life of consistency, okay? Live a life of consistency. And we pick up towards the end of chapter one there in verse 27, uh, he wrote this, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and I think one of the struggles that a lot that turn people off in church, turn people that don't go to church, turn them off a lot, you know, that are on the outside, is when there is a, a duplicity, when Christians profess one thing and yet they live another 
way. I mean, that's literally where we get the word, you know, two-faced or hypocrisy. You know, you're one way with one group of people and one way with another. And I'm not talking about, you know, yes, there are ways I read through the Bible and I know the truth and I believe it and I know how my words, actions, and deeds are and I struggle, but I'm attempting to do that. I'm talking about when literally, like I just said, when I'm with this group of people, when I come to church and I preach, I act this way, I say these words, you know, and, and that. But then when I go out, you know, and, and I'm out with this group, I'm a whole nother person. That's the duplicity that I think a lot of people struggle with. And Paul says, whatever happens, regardless of the circumstances that we encounter, we must choose to act consistently in the same God-honoring way. Meaning I'm supposed to be the exact same person, whether I'm taking communion with you here this morning or I'm sitting at home, you know, tonight holding a remote control, whether I'm 500 miles away in a hotel all by myself or whether I'm in the living room with my family. Live consistently and represent Jesus well because that makes the gospel easier for those around us to understand. And you hear me talk about the gospel uh, a lot and, and, uh, and, you know, in 1 Corinthians it tells us, you know, what is this good news? What is this good news when you hear me stand up here and teach and preach? I say we need to represent the gospel. And like I said, Paul, when he was writing the Corinth, he said, this is the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what we get to stand for. That's what we get to share. And Paul's saying when you align, when your life aligns with the life of Christ, then all of a sudden it just makes the gospel easier for those around you to understand. Because if I believe that Jesus died for me, then I'm going to be living in such a way knowing that my sins have been forgiven. And because he conquered the grave, then I can have this hope of eternal life. And that should, you know, that, that should affect the way that people see me. And I realize when it comes to consistency, we struggle though, okay? We struggle because of this guy, you know, named Satan that is alive and well. And, and I'm not one of those people that, you know, you can find Satan, you know, uh, under every single little rock that's there. But I do believe, because the Bible talks about him, I do believe that he is real and I do believe that he wants to affect our life. I mean, in John 10, 10, it says, remember what it tells us? He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to rob that joy. He wants us to be affected by our external circumstances, realizing that, that what's happening on the outside, it, you know, that's what affects us. That's what's real truth. And it doesn't matter what's on the inside, you know, that he wants to disrupt our life. And, and the picture that I have, have of this a lot of the times, I, I'm not a, a baseball fan. I mean, I have nothing against baseball. I just, you know, never played it growing up. Wasn't a sport I was interested in. And I don't mind watching it, but I saw this TikTok clip, you know, about the stadium in, in San Francisco. And it was just hilarious. I probably watched it way too many times, wasted way too many hours of my life uh, just watching this single little clip over and over and over again. But I think it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's there at the stadium in San Francisco. Part of the stadium faces uh, this water out there called McCovey's Cove that's right there. And when a game's going on, they only allow kayakers to be out there, not big boats. You'll understand why in just a second. And that, but, but people People sit out there in kayaks hoping for that moment because if you get the right hitter, they can knock it over the wall and the ball lands in the water and, you know, and they're going to kind of grab it. Now, they may go games before that ever happens or it could happen a couple times in a game. They don't know, but they're just out there waiting for that. And when that $3 ball hits, <laughs> you know, they go after that crazy thing, you know, like somehow I'm going to show this to my grandchildren, whatever. You know, well, here's a clip. This is the clip I keep watching over and over. I need to delete it so I don't watch it as much. But... Trying to get to it. Don't give McCovey go Dave all that time. <laughs> yep. He's just too good. I think that woman just gave him the New York City Cab salute. I think I think he deserved it. No, he gave it back. Yeah, there you go. Now, I think of that as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, that we're going through life and life seems to be good, you know, and then all of a sudden something pops down in front of us. It looks really good and we go towards that and we're excited about that and there might be others going for it, but it looks like we're getting really close to it and we reach out and then Satan just comes along and just scoops it out and, and that. And I am a little disturbed that the person that's the character of Satan goes by in a shirt and a thing that says Dave on it. That's a whole nother story, okay? But you understand the illustration that, that's there. You know, he doesn't want you, he doesn't want you to understand the joy that can be in, internally because of what Christ 
Christ has done for us within our life. And he wants you to be affected by what's going on. I mean, just like that lady, when Dave grabbed that, you just saw her just kind of lump over. That's, you know, this external circumstance, that's what he wants her to be affected by uh, and, and stuff. And, and he wants to do that. And, and part of rethinking about our attitude is striving for consistency in our daily walk, regardless of the painful circumstances that we have to endure. And Paul says, whatever happens, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And when he was writing to those in Thessalonians, he said, we're to praise God in the good times and the bad, in, you know, in a life of consistency. And again, when a Christian and a non-Christian go through the same struggle and everything, you know, go through the same hardship, whatever it would be, uh, you know, those around us should be able to see the difference between the way the two of us handle it. It's not that those who believe in Christ aren't going to have pain and feel pain and everything, but how do we handle that? Where do we turn? It, it, you know, it, it should be different in that because whatever happens, we're conducting ourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that first ingredient is live a life to consistency. The second ingredient is, and this basically goes more towards those that would call themselves Christians, followers of Christ, have a spirit of unity. Make sure we're working to have a spirit of unity at whatever cost. And in verses 27 again and starting at 28, Paul said, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Can you hear all the references to unity? As we look at, I mean, stand firm in one spirit, striving together, strive together as one in faith. That, that phrase, stand firm, or maybe your translation says stand fast, it's actually a military term. And, and where you would see it a lot is like, especially this is what made the Roman soldiers so successful in a lot of their battles, because when they would come together, you'd see that they have in this picture there, you know, they would come together and stand firm. They would put their shields together the way they are all the way down the line. And when they did that, they were almost, not completely, but almost impregnable. People couldn't get in. Uh, <coughs> going too fast again, you know? And, and they were protected, you know? And they, they, were, they were safe in that setup and, and, and allowed them to win so many different battles as they came together, as they worked together as, I guess you could say, as a team, you know, and, and put those shields in. And it wasn't about themselves just out there trying to protect themselves and get away. They came together and worked together. Um, like I said, a lot of times I get a sports illustration when you hear me talk about it. I usually talk about football because that was my sport. And when I played football, I, you know, I had our game jersey. And on the front of our game jersey, well, it said the Cardinals because I played high school for Newton Cardinals. And on the back was my name. And, and you'll see that in a lot of sports today, college, pro, uh, high school, you know, and all that in, in different sports. The front's the team they represent and the back is, is the person who plays on that team and who it is. And, and, and sometimes through a game, but a lot of times in practice, my coach would always say to us, listen, remember, you're playing for the name on the front of the jersey, not the name on the back. It, it's, it, it's not the Newton Beals or the Newton whatever. You are the Newton Cardinals. And when we come together as a team, that's what's going to, when we work together as a team, that's what's going to make us successful, you know, when it comes to this. And, 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 and there's a point where you, you've got to understand that, especially as we come together as the family of God, that, you know, at that point, we're not worried about the individual, individual achievements because it's for the team. There's a greater cause. And Paul's suggesting that the family God, that's what we are. We're this, we're this family, yes, we're this team, and it doesn't matter what is on the name of the back. You know, Pastor Dave, that doesn't matter, okay? It's the person on the front that we come together and we live for Jesus Christ. And Paul was stressing to the Christians because they were in the midst of intimidation, persecution, opposition, you know? And he doesn't want them to be separated. He wants them to be, like he just said in the scriptures, he wants them to be united, to stand firm in one spirit. Because while our faith is being tested on a daily basis, he says, I don't want you to fear those who oppose you. And that phrase that he uses, being frightened or, or terrified, is actually a phrase that's talking about, you know, this, this inward feeling we have because of an outward an outward stimulus. And in their particular case, it was persecution. In their time and what was going on, it was, not, it was not a good time, especially for Christians. They were under persecution. And Paul was trying to help him remember what Jesus said when Jesus walked amongst us and was with us, when Jesus was teaching the people and sharing with them. And he shared in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, he said this, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. Meaning, have this healthy fear of God. 
But for those of but for those people who are going to disagree and hate on us for our faith, you know, and make it difficult, we, we don't need to fear them. We don't need to fear them because we're not in this battle alone. First and foremost, when we give our lives to Christ, we're filled with the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us. And then we have the family of God, the team that's going to be standing. And realize when I say that, Okay, I want to emphasize this and make sure you understand that. I'm not talking about perfect people. We learned this in the very first sermon of the series. We're not imperfect people in an imperfect world. We're not going to be perfect till Christ comes with us. All right, uh, that team I told you I played for, Newton Cardinals. I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but but you know we did something no team has ever done. We've gone undefeated. We've won state championship that year, and it wasn't because we were perfect kids. We came together as a team. See, uh, on that team. I had teammates and stuff like that, you know, that we went out on the field and we played these games and we worked together, you know. But there were times off the field and even on the field, you know, that they didn't like me and I didn't like them. When I had a really good friend, my best friend, uh, and that, and, and he was growing so fast, you know. You know, you kind of grow fast, you kind of become clumsy and awkward. and that kind of, well, well, that was my buddy. And on the field, he was a great football player, okay, um, and somehow he could transit, but when he came off the field, he was just a klutz and stuff, and kind of his looks growing with it and all this other. And these other players, that, you know, they were making fun of him. They constantly make fun of him from being that way, and not in a fun jo- jousting way, but in a really bullying type of way, if you will allow me, from that standpoint. One day at lunch, um, they were going at him again. He didn't even realize it because my teammates wouldn't do it. He didn't realize it was about him that they were joking. I did. I'd had enough, and I took my little mashed potatoes, my full plate of food. I just had mashed potatoes and gravy. Our star running back was in front of us and just flipped that plate of food right in front of him. Of course, he's up telling me what he's going to do to me, and I'm telling him, yeah, right, come on, and, you know, we go at it right there, okay? This is the guy that I play on this team with that I block for. That's on a Friday. We got a football game that night. We went out and we won, okay? Because why? Because I didn't sit there after that happened and say, I'm sorry, coach. I can't. I can't be on a team where people say those mean things. I can't play on a team that people make me feel uncomfortable. I can't. I I just can't do it, coach. I'm I'm, I'm quitting. I'm out of here. And they didn't say that either. We came together. We worked together. It wasn't easy. Uh, You know, um, it took me a while (laughs) to want the block for them and and stuff and, and everything. But we worked it out. And we worked and we came together as a team, even with our differences. And even with that, you know, and and if we can do that on the football field, we got to be doing that as a family of God. We need to be doing that as the family of God as we come together, all right? I I, got to go on with it and, 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 and stuff, you know, but that's the importance of why we come and we gather. You know, I, I, I love live stream. I'm glad we have live stream. For those, you know, like, I, I know, like, you know, we, we were talking about George, George Krebs that goes to our church, broke his ankle. Lauren was talking about him last week, you know, in three different spots. He had surgery on Friday. He's doing good. He's probably watching right now. Hey, Georgie, you know, and, and, and all that. And, and I'm, I'm glad that it's there. I'm glad for when people are sick that they can turn and they can watch it. I'm glad because I know there's people that are tuning in. Some of you, you watched online, you know, uh, quite a while before you actually came and joined us. And if you're watching online, I'm glad that you're here. And if, if you felt led to come in and be live with us, I would love to have you come in and join us live. But I also know, I also know just as much as I love it, I don't like it. If I got to be open and honest and transparent, because I know, I know that when it comes to it, live stream has become very convenient for a lot of people who used to come and gather together. And we've forgotten the importance of gathering together. You know, it, it is a lot easier, I have to admit, you know. It's a lot easier to get up, you know, and, and, and just grab a cup of coffee and sit down and watch it on TV and then go on than have to get up and get ready, you know, and, and, and think about all that, you know, what you got to do to get ready, get dressed, get showered, you know, get kids ready, get all that, and then come drive here and be here and then leave. It, it's just very, very convenient, and we forget how beautiful it is when we come together you know, as a family, you know, and, and to come in and to worship with others and that we can see, that we can support, you know, it enabled us to serve as a part of the body of Christ. Because yes, I believe watching online, you're going to get fed, okay? I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but coming in person allows you to join a team and enables you to feed others. 
and encourage others and be encouraged by others and to use your gifts. I mean, I've seen people come in here that didn't know each other. They started coming for a while and, and uh, through either coming to an event or maybe somebody knew they were going through the same circumstances, they found out they connected and they realized they're both going through the exact same circumstances and they exchange numbers and they're talking and sharing and they start doing what we talk, you hear me talk about, start doing life together. They're there supporting and walking all, you know, they're there to give encouragement, encouragement that they have before like thinking, how am I going to get through this? And now here's somebody that knows exactly what they feel, what they're experiencing. All because why? Because they walk through some doors. It's so important that we understand what it means to be the ecclesia, just to come together, why we gather, not about us, but giving God the praise and glory and honor he so rightly deserves so we can be there as a family and learn to, how to support each other and then go out and take this truth that we have that we learn about, you know? And, and, and I know, like I said, uh, again, I, I know it's easy, but when you come to worship God and you come to bless others, you know, that, that we become unified. And when the church is unified, God is glorified. And I need to move on from that aspect. But uh, in the next verse, Paul tells him, he says, look, here's a couple beautiful opportunities you have in verse 29. For it has been granted you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So Christ says, listen, you've been granted the opportunity to believe in Christ, which is awesome, because without belief, there would be no opportunity for salvation. But then he has to follow it up, and Paul goes on to say, and not only that, there's more, you also have the opportunity to suffer for Christ. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll, I'll take the belief part of it. Can you take my suffering in? Yeah, that person needs a double dose over right there, okay? Go ahead and pass my suffering on, because it's not something we want, is it? It's not something that we seek out, and yet I think there's a lot of people that when they talk about their growth, or you hear them give their testimonies about you know, how their faith got deepened, it was because of that suffering, because of that adversity that forced them to get out of their comfort zone and lean on God in ways they never thought they would. I mean, last week we talked about that. We talked about suffering, and we, we talked about our struggle, and the reasons you know, uh, uh, of the growth that was there. And, and in our life. And, and we've, we've talked about it several times this year already. At the beginning of the year, we went through how the church came about, why we call it church, its purpose. We remember, and we talked about the apostles, remember, and, 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 and what they went through and, and how, you know, they were preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. Remember Acts chapter 5, starting verse 40? They called the apostles in, and they had them flogged. And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. And they're like, we're not going to stop speaking. We've heard him. We spent time with him. We've heard this guy teach. We've seen his teachings. He predicted his death. And then he rose from the grave. We're not going to stop talking about him. In verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. What a strange response. They're flogged, almost beaten to death, and they celebrate. Why? I mean, Jesus predicted, listen, if you live for me, if you follow me, if you surrender to me, you're going to have persecution. It's just going to happen. There are going to be people, even close family, that may walk away, that are going to say things. You're going to have stuff that there's going to be this persecution and everything, and, and it happened. It happened in their life, but they became unified with Christ. Because he said, look, it, when you follow me, this is what's going to happen. When you go out, and even though you're speaking truth, and even though you're doing it for a loving reason, because you want the best of the best of the best of these people, hopefully that's why you're speaking it and how you're sharing it, there's going to be that. And the persecution comes all because you're united with Christ, being like Christ. And my friends, that brings us joy because unity brings us joy in our lives. Well, thirdly, I got to go on. We, we, we have our life of consistency, that ingredient, a spirit of unity. And the third ingredient is an attitude of humility. An attitude of humility. We pick up here in, in chapter two, starting verse three, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. I heard some describe ambition as meaning intentionality towards a, a goal. And if the goal is from God, yeah, that's not selfish, you know, unless we, allow, it's good, you know, as long as we don't let selfish motives and pride and greed come into the picture in that. And, and maybe a goal that we can have is something we can start, maybe starting today to decide that one of the things that we could do, we could come together, is every person we come in contact with, we're going to give value to them. That's hard. 
you know. But I think it's one of the struggles that we have going on today. Because like I said at the beginning, we, so many people are looking to outside sources to find their meaning, their value, and their worth. And those are wrong sources. And you know, Satan is the father of lies. He's lying to them about what's important, about what's not. He's deceiving them. He's the father of deception. He's deceiving them. And, and they're believing all these other things that are important. They're trying to find their value. And wh- whatever it takes, I don't care who I have to step on, who I have to put down, uh, who I have to do whatever I got to do to, as long as it makes me feel good, makes me look good. That, and we see this happening in our society because people have forgotten where our true value comes from. And it comes because we are children of God, created in God's image what that means and what that looks like, you know? And, 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 and so maybe we just need to start looking in the eyes of people and showing them value. I don't know what that would be for you. Maybe it's just a smile, a kind word, you know? I, I don't know what, what that would be, you know, but giving them something they don't expect. And then Paul says, here you go. Here's the key to changing your attitude. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I mean, the Son of God, the creator of all we know, on a cross. He could have taken himself down. He could have, but he stays up there. Why? For me, for you. He gives us a pathway to heaven. He made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He endured the pain of the cross, and he was crucified in our place. When I was a youth minister in Southern California, uh, I got together with several other youth ministers, and we decided to take our youth groups to go ice skating at the ice skating rink. And so we're there and having a good time, but as as it doesn't take long, a couple of, of the youth came up and challenged me to race them. They wanted to have a race around the rink with it. And you got to know a couple things about me. First of all, when it comes to ice skating, I'm not built that way. Okay, I'm not built to do that. I, I, I don't understand. Now, I mean, you, you see the Olympics, okay? And you see them do all those moves and those spins and the legs going. I can do those exact same things, but I'm doing them so I don't fall on my face and kill myself, all right? I'm not, and it doesn't look as pretty, but if you've ever watched me ice skate, and these kids had seen me ice skate, you know, but the second thing that you have to get to know about me that I'm constantly praying about is uh, because I am extremely highly competitive, all right, in the stupidest, littlest things. It doesn't matter what it is. That's why at church picnics and all that that we do, they don't let me play volleyball anymore, okay? You know, I'm just highly competitive. So I look at these kids who have seen me skate, who know, and I'm like, you're on, you know? And they're like, you think you can beat us? I'm taking you down. In the love of Jesus, of course, you know, and so we start and we go and, and someone says go and we're going and I'm actually quite impressed if I have to brag on myself this time I am bragging because we're going around the first lap and I'm kind of like a NASCAR driver, okay, or, or a race car. I'm, I'm behind these other three kids and I'm drafting them. All right. And I'm going around drafting and I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm keeping up with them and I'm going to look at my time and pass them. But as we get around in the second lap, here comes that kid that it doesn't matter if you're an ice skating rink or a roller rink, this little four, five, six year old, you know, that's a really great skater and you're like, that's new you know, and decides to cut right in front of me, decides to cut right out in front of me and stuff. And I have two choices, one of the flesh and one of the spirit. And my flesh is I need to take him out. All right. The kid has to learn when he wakes up from the hospital that you don't cut in front of people my size. But thankfully, the Holy Spirit overpowered me that day. And I thought, no. And I I took a hard cut to the right. And I see him coming right towards the wall. And I think with my brute force and strength and, you know, young man that I was back then, I'm going to hit that wall, push off that wall and shoot right back into the race. And as I come up to that wall and push off that wall, there's a nail sticking out. You know, thankfully it just kind of grazed, but it was enough to do blood and enough to make me say, ow. And I get back in the race, but of course I'm too far behind on this one. I didn't push off with the brute force like I thought I would. And I end up losing. And they, the, the, the youth are coming up, you know, doing their pride. Yeah, we beat you. We knew we would. You stink. Da, da, da. And then they see blood and they're like, oh, Pastor Dave, you're bleeding, you know? And I saw this as my opportunity. Yeah, that's why I lost the race. <laughs> You know, being the good Christian guy that I was back then, yeah, this is, this is why I lost the race right here, okay? And, and, and stuff, and I, and I congratulate him, and, says, and I got to go get this checked out, see if I needed a shot or whatever. But, but I share that with you, you know, and, 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 and I kind of purposely shared that with you to kind of pull you in, because I want you to think about this. I told you that story, you know, because did you notice what happened as I got to that story at the point of where I talked about my hand hitting that nail? 
you win. I mean, we heard this verbal response. You could loudly hear this verbal response. Now, here's where I, I'm going to set the hook, I guess you could say, is that, in that, you know, we flinched at that, but how come we no longer flinch when we hear the words that Jesus was crucified? When we hear that, you know, wow, why is there no lump in my throat when I hear somebody say they drove spikes into his hands and his feet? For me, Ten Fingers Pointed Here, has the story of the cross become so routine for me, for you, for us, that we're more stressed over an accidental piercing rather than an intentional sacrifice? You know, as time, and I think it has, time kind of sanitized the suffering of our Savior to the point where it actually no longer touches our heart anymore. See, I, we gather each week, which we're going to do in just a couple moments here. We, we come before these cups. If you're visiting with us, we have the tables that are here uh, and, and the back right there. Um, you know, and, and we partake of these two cups that represent the body and the blood of Christ that was sacrificed for us, that went through things unimaginable we can't imagine that's there. But we do that to take time to pause, to remember, to cringe. Somebody loves me that much. You know, somebody would go through that much for me? Wow. To remember that, wow, this past week, as I look at this past week, how selfish I was in my, with my wife or how selfish I was with my kids or how selfish I was because I didn't value or whatever. And to take some time and repent during that time and say, God, please forgive me for being so selfish and not being selfless, not being more unified, not being more like Christ. You know, we, we come during that time, but also we, we come at that time to let God's Holy Spirit speak to us and help us remember and rejoice and celebrate that we have a God that is still there today, willing to help us when we surrender, willing to guide, lead, and direct us when we surrender to Him and be there and to help us become unified even when we don't want to become unified, to, to help us, you know, uh, take and do everything that we talked about here in these ingredients and put them to practice. You see, Christ himself, you know, after he did all this suffering, verse 9, it says this, after he went through all this, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I'm around the world, we love the rags to riches story. You know, with somebody that's struggling, they're having a hard time, but somehow they make it. They pull themselves up by the bootstraps, whatever we say within the world, and, and they become successful in the world's eyes. We, we love those stories, but Jesus' story is just the opposite. He went from riches to rags. I mean, he leaves the, the halls of glory in heaven to the nails of Calgary, and he comes down to earth, and he submits himself to his Father's will. Remember, Lord, Dad, not my will, but your will be done. And he ends up doing the will of the Father. And he sacrifices his life so we can have that way to heaven, you know? And I know there's so many different times in our life we say, I, I know, I, I, someday I will. I know, but, but I have this. You don't understand the business. We talked about that so many different times. I know that someday, I, I know I will bow my knee to Jesus. I mean, when he returns, boom, I know I'll bow to him. Yeah, you will. <laughs> Because we won't have a choice. People won't have a choice. You know, our choice, though, we have is still right now. The choice that we want to make in following him. See, C.S. Lewis, I love what he said. He said it this way. You get no credit for bowing down when it's become impossible for you to stand. And we won't be able to stand on that day when Christ returns. You know, everybody, it doesn't matter what your title is, it? we'll fall on our knees. So the challenge, the caution, the warning, the encouragement, I hope it is, is simple. We live a life of consistency with a spirit of unity and with an attitude of humility. And all that comes because we surrender our life to Christ and make him Lord and more important than anything else within our life. And like I said, we're going to come, take these two cups, come back to your seat and remember and celebrate all this. But I also want to encourage you, you know, just to let God speak to your heart and see where you're at. Is your life consistent? Are you unified with that? Are we humble? Are we humble with that? And if there's a decision you want to make, if there's prayers that you need, uh, you know, then see one of us today. One of the leaderships comes to find myself, uh, one of the leaders here today. If you're watching online, please call in. We'd love to talk with you about that, about what that means, you know, within your life and to be there for you that way, definitely. 
But let's go before him right now and let him work in our lives. Father, I thank you for this time we can gather, we can celebrate, we can remember, we can rejoice, uh, Lord, because we have a God that loves us the way that you do, Lord. And as we come before these emblems and what they represent, Lord, I pray, Father, I pray that our hearts will remember the sacrifice made. I pray that our hearts will celebrate, Father God, and rejoice for the kind of love that is there for us, Heavenly Father. And I pray that our spirits will be open to hear, Lord, what you've spoken to us today and the steps we need to take today, Father God, so we can put these ingredients we've learned about into our life and be the family of God. Come together as the team you'd want us to be, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of sin, for rising again to save us, a sacrifice for my life, for our lives, for every individual, for God so loved me. 
Father, I'm so grateful for what you've done for us. As we go from this place today, Lord, we just pray that we would be able to take our worship, we would take our praise, we would take what we've learned, the message we've received, apply it to our lives, and just let that be the Jesus people see in us every day. In your name we pray. Amen.